something a little different. This is All Saints Sunday. All Saints Day was uh, earlier uh, at the end of last week. And today is All Saints Sunday. And uh, there's a kind of disconnect in different denominations about the meaning of All Saints Day and uh, exactly how it should be and why it should be celebrated. But the main thrust of it, no matter what some of the disconnects might be, is that there are those who have gone on before us, those who died in the faith, uh, died in Christ, who are with our Lord. And um, there are also people who have uh, gone on that have uh, made a big impact in your life and uh, in my life as well. Many of you know that uh, uh, my, my mother, I guess I've shared this before, my mother, was uh, one of those persons that opened the church and closed the church. I mean, she was there if something was going on and even if something wasn't going on, she was there. I mean, she uh, she did the bulletins. She did the children's sermons in every worship service. She uh, uh, did all the secretarial work. And I mean, she was one of those persons that church can't do without. And uh, I got to, over at uh, Mount Zion, some of the ladies take part in doing the children's sermon uh, Occasionally, uh, actually, just about one of, well, let's see, I do it about once a month, and they do it the rest of the time. And some of the ladies have their own children that they're talking to during the children's time. And uh, I got to thinking about the way my mother um, had that impact on me. The ripples of her faithfulness um, helped point me in a, in a good direction. And uh, She's been with the Lord now for quite a number of years, and uh, you know I, I never get shed of those ripples. Um, that's one of the things that we have here is ripples this morning. Uh, we have pebbles to drop into the water to remind us of the impact that people have had on our lives. Um, the bread. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to do when I come to this bread loaf is I'm going to pinch off a piece of it. I'm going to hold it between my fingers and I'm going to knead it. Uh, I'm going to manipulate it back and forth and form it. Reminds us that what Jesus came to do in us, what the Holy Spirit does in us, is form us in the image of Christ. He changes us. There are people in your life who had great amount of uh, impact in forming you, perhaps in Christian service, perhaps in many different ways. But uh, you're getting the idea that we're not just coming for a religious observance, a ritual here. What we're doing is we are remembering and we are honoring those that have gone before, those who had impact in our life, and those who have shaped us and formed us for living our lives. The light of the world, there are people who have been light to you, the, the refreshing water, there are people who have been refreshment to you. So this is what I would like to invite you to do. I would like to invite each of you, as we come to the Lord's Supper, to, uh, to leave your seats and to come here. Um, and starting over on this side over here, we'll work our way this way and then we'll work our way back to our seat. Or you might want to stop at the altar to offer a few prayer uh, in, in, the, in the name of your loved one, to give thanks to the Lord for what your loved ones have meant to you. As my mother meant to me, my dad, and a host of others, I think of Luther Gore, who was a preaching professor in seminary, who uh, taught me some things about preaching that I still can't get shed of. I mean, he's, uh, he's in my heart, and I love him. Dr. Brazil, who taught me to lighten up a little bit while we worship, because God loves to hear his children laugh. Um, many others who had a hand in shaping me into the person that I am. Uh, such as it is. But you're invited to come. Stop at the candle, perhaps, and just uh, remember those who have been light to you, and thank He who is light. To uh, knead a piece of the dough, and remember those who formed you for His service, and thank He who is the bread of life uh, for what He has done to form you. And then pick up the pebble and drop it into the water and Watch the ripples and remember the ripples of faith that others created in you for health and nurture. So you're invited. You come as you will. How good.
you who are light and truth, in whom there is no variation, no darkness. We thank you, the bread of life. Without yeast, without evil. We thank you who gives the water of eternal life. Lord, we're so thankful for our loved ones who made an impact on our lives. We're so thankful for Jesus Christ who made the supreme impact for us. We thank you, Lord, that as we remember our loved ones and honor their lives by these simple acts of looking at ripples, feeling the formation of bread, coming near the light, these simple reminders that help us remember we are not islands unto ourselves. We are, we are part of your creation. We are part of not only this worldwide church, but the cosmic church. Both the church here on earth and the church triumphant in heaven. Thank you, Father, for that connection that we celebrate today. Help us to live our lives in such a way that others who come behind us will remember us on a day like this, should you give and carry. These things we pray to you, loving you, offering ourselves to you, in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The Word of God for the people of God. collect his countrymen's taxes. Now, these are well-known facts. Uh, 
the uh, fact is that Zacchaeus could collect any amount that he wanted. He just about had a license to steal. If he wanted to take three times what the Roman government expected him to turn in, that was his business. They didn't question it. They just wanted what they wanted. So Zacchaeus had pretty much a license to steal from his own people. It was no wonder tax collectors were hated. So what we see in this story is a shadowy reference of three people. First person we see is somebody like Jacob, who was sneaky and deceptive and a self-server. But scripture tells us that Jacob eventually wrestled with God. You remember when that happened at the river Jabbok? How Jacob wrestled with God? And God renamed him. He came up with a new name. He became Israel. That name that is the namesake of God's very own special people. Then a second person that we see in this story, a second kind of person, is Zacchaeus himself, who was considered a traitor to his nation. He was despicable. He was greedy. He uh, meets Jesus, and according to the story, he becomes a repentant, generous philanthropist. And finally, a third one. We see Jacob, we see Zacchaeus, and then we see you and me. Because we are all Jacob or Zacchaeus in the making in some way or another. And the task that we have in front of us today as we wrestle as Jacob did with God at the river Jabbok is to unpack the truth about this man behind the fig leaves in the sycamore fig tree. And maybe in the process learn something about ourselves. Now, we do this to better understand how to come out from behind from behind our own fig leaves that leave us shamefully lacking in our relationship to God, in our walk with Jesus. We want to be honest in our relationship with God, so we want to receive His presence like the tax collector did. Did you catch the end of the story? When Jesus said, Zacchaeus, you come down here because I'm going to your house today, and Zacchaeus came down very quickly and he went with Jesus to his home, took him to his home, and it says, with great excitement and joy. Incidentally, if you're following along, you can uh, use the insert that's in the bulletin. It gives us seven adjectives to describe the man behind the fig leaves. And that's what I want to give you this morning. Um, first adjective is powerful. Zacchaeus was very powerful. That's the P on your outline. Verse 2 says that uh, he was the chief tax collector in the region. The good Dr. Luke recalls that Zacchaeus was at the head of the table when it came to being tax collectors. He was the chief guy. He was the one who set the rules. You know the old saying about the lead dog? The lead dog goes anywhere he wants to, and the rest that follow have to look at his wagging tail, right? Well, that's not a very pretty sight. Zacchaeus may have been a, a wee little man, as the children's song goes, but he was the most influential man in that part of the world. This story is all about how Zacchaeus came to be a disciple of Jesus. And that seems to me rather odd because uh, if you stop and think about it, powerful people do not tend to trust other people's lead. They trust themselves. Think about all of the people, the men, who have been elected president. Do you think any one of them sitting in the Oval Office had a pension to follow somebody else's lead? No. The reason why they got elected was because they, they saw themselves as being able to do the job and lead everybody else. And this was the, you know, you know take Zacchaeus and place him in the Oval Office at the Resolute Desk right now. And uh, think about Zacchaeus in that way, a powerful man, somebody who was very influential. But the story here tells us something about this man who climbed up in the fig tree. He figured it out that his power was nothing compared to what he'd seen in Jesus. Zacchaeus may have been a powerful man, but he had nothing on Jesus. The second adjective that we find, besides the fact that Zacchaeus was very powerful, was that Zacchaeus was very rich. It says it straight out in the end of verse 2, he had become very rich. Interesting how in this story the religious rulers pointed to Zacchaeus and said that the chief tax collector was a crook and uh, they were in charge of the temple business. Now, 
whatever Zacchaeus was doing, whatever illegal or immoral things that he was doing to, you know, to extract money from the people that were his own countrymen, he had nothing on the religious leaders who conducted temple business. They uh, demanded everybody exchange their Roman money for temple currency to pay the required tithes every year. That's like saying, all right, you give me gold and silver, I'll give, give you this little ticket here and you can take that to the temple. Uh, you know, which was worth more, the little certificate or the gold and the silver? You see, uh, this was big business. This was done at a rate of exchange that would have made today's credit card interest of 29% looked like a good deal. I mean, these were, these were crooked religious priests. The rulers also sponsored selling sacrificially pure animals, doves and lambs, for more than a month's pay to the average guy. And so you would have to give up one-twelfth of your entire salary just to buy a lamb to sacrifice at the temple. You didn't even get to eat it, actually. The rulers complaining about Jesus associating with a sinner like Zacchaeus, that was like the proverbial pot, calling a kettle black. Well, they were a mob in clergy groups. Zacchaeus was powerful. He was very rich. But number three, Zacchaeus was also very curious. Look what it says in verse three. He tried to get a look at Jesus. Zacchaeus knew that he wouldn't be able to see uh, over the crowd. And so uh, he climbed up in this tree to get a look at Jesus, the healer. Jesus had gone viral by this point in the story, and Zacchaeus not only had heard of him, Zacchaeus knew that he had no more about this guy. And today we would call the tax collector seeker. Somebody that's not willing or ready to jump in and be a follower, but somebody who really just wanted to know more at this point. He wanted to be convinced. Now it occurs to me that Zacchaeus was probably farther along in that seeking process than we're told here. And the reason I think that is because uh, you think with me for just a moment. Do not rich and powerful people have assistance to do the dirty work? Now, if you get somebody that's very wealthy, very powerful, does he do all the stuff himself or does he send his staffers to do this or that? If Zacchaeus was idly curious about Jesus, he might have sent a staffer to check out what was happening. But this... What we see here is full-blown, hands-on seeking. This powerful rich man personally shinned up that sycamore fig tree to get a look at Jesus. The curious, tax-collecting seeker had to see for himself. So, here we have a man who is very powerful, very rich, very curious, and now we all know, number four, Zacchaeus was very, say it with me, that's the S word there, short. Um, verse 3 said he was too short to see over the crowd. Uh, most of you, many of you know my daughter Jennifer is, uh, let's say, vertically challenged. Jennifer's short, okay. <laughs> Jen Jennifer, hello. <laughs> Jennifer is, uh, is not a tall person. She's a person of Zacchaeus-like statue. And so anytime we get together, I mean, for years, the short jokes have been thrown around. It's never really mean-spirited stuff. We have a lot of fun with it. But I try not to push the envelope. I will tell you about another friend of mine who loves the fact that he's short, too. Elwood Baker is a dear friend. More than 35 years I've known him. He lives in Florida. He's um, 90 years old plus, and he's still preaching the gospel, Pants. He's still preaching the gospel every single week. Anytime he gets an opportunity, he's opening his mouth and preaching the gospel. He's not much more than five feet tall, and he loves to laugh about it. One time he was in a meeting, and uh, he was sitting in the back, and the guy that was conducting the meeting recognized him. He said, Brother Baker, I see you back there. You can speak. And uh, so Elwood started to speak, and the man said, no, 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 stand up and speak. And he said, oh, you are standing. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, I can understand this if we had set the clocks ahead and you were sleep. But, you know, you had an extra hour of sleep, so, you know, come on, track with me here. We do know that despite the shortcomings, pun intended, at the end of this story, Zacchaeus is the hero, isn't he? He's the hero who, compared to the religious good people, is, boy, he's a moral mountain. 
But herein is a key that you ought not to miss about this, about his shortness. It's a mistake to look on the outside and judge the inside. Morally speaking, Zacchaeus and the religious leaders were kind of on <coughs> even ground here, but the difference between the two was that Zacchaeus was willing to repent. He was willing to do something about his shortfall of character. The religious leaders just grumbled. They looked at Jesus and they said, huh, he's supposed to be a morally good man, he's supposed to be a rabbi a teacher, and he's associating with a sinner tax collector. And by that, they were <coughs> condemning and judging Zacchaeus as well. But don't we always do that? Isn't that human nature? You look at the TV ads, what do they pander to? They pander to all of the physical attributes, especially those of the sensual and the strength <coughs> issues. It's all about the men's muscles and the, the model's hair and her shape. How shallow, how tender is all of that? Trust me, eventually, hair either turns gray or turns blue. And the body grows weaker and everything sad. Can I get an amen? We need to concentrate not on the of the physical stature, but on the tallness of whatever is eternal. So, we have these four characteristics, adjectives, if you will. He's very powerful, very rich, very curious, very short. And then Zacchaeus was also very empty. Look at verses 4 through 6. So he ran ahead climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I want to be a guest in your home today. Boy, I like that. Zacchaeus, you know, he, he's sitting there, and what could he say, you know? The preacher invites himself over for dinner. That's all there is to it. He's got to go. And he climbs down quickly, it says, and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. You know, I, I was struck by two words there. Uh, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. And Zacchaeus did what? He quickly climbed down. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like obedience, doesn't it? He responded immediately. Zacchaeus, I believe, was a very empty soul. How do I know that? Well, when Jesus invited himself to dinner at Zacchaeus' house, he was overwhelmed with joy, but that tells us something here. As a rich man, don't you think that Zacchaeus, uh, being an influential and rich man, he probably had a big circle of uh, social or social circle friends and very influential people, rich people just like himself, and he probably entertained them with lavish parties. I mean, that's what they do, and... Uh, but that kind of stuff goes old and cold in a hurry, doesn't it? Doesn't the endless cycle of parties that are fluff and all surface, don't they grow old? Doesn't that kind of activity, which is pretty fruitless, seem to, uh, I mean, if you look at the lifestyles of the rich and famous, what do you see? You see the emptiness behind the glitz and the makeup. Look at the long list of suicides in that camp. Zacchaeus was headed down that road. And he was really empty because when Jesus brought the good news that Jesus was going to take a personal interest in Zacchaeus and go to his house and sit and eat with him, the most social thing that could be done, still is, by the way, sharing a meal together is one of the most social things we do, the most intimate things that we do. Incidentally, did you notice that Zacchaeus was a lot like Adam. Adam hid behind fig leaves too, didn't he? <laughs> and uh, the tax collector saw that he had just been friended by one who could make a difference in his life. I think that's where the, the uh, emptiness had to fade into the background, but that kind of proves the emptiness. Incidentally, did you notice the first word spoken between these two men? How, how did that play out? Zacchaeus climbs up in a tree waiting for Jesus to come by. Jesus starts coming by. Did Zacchaeus call out to him? No. Jesus looked up and saw him. What did Jesus say? What's the first word out of his mouth? Zacchaeus! Call him by name. And you know what the Bible tells us? On the day that is resurrection day, that's how it's going to play out. 
You see, he knows each of us by name. And for those who are in Christ Jesus, just like he called Lazarus out of a stone-cold dead grave. And the first word out of his mouth when he was about to do that was, Lazarus, come forth. Zacchaeus, quickly come down. That's how Jesus is going to do it. He's going to say, Philip, get up out of that grave. That's what he's going to do. And for everybody who has named the name, called upon the name that's above every name, Jesus, Lord, Savior, King, he'll call that name, he'll call your name, if you've trusted in him. And then right in line with the rest of the fact that Zacchaeus <coughs> was very powerful, very rich, very short, very curious, and very empty man, is that he was also very lost. <coughs> Zacchaeus was headed for hell. Look at what uh, verses 7 and 8 say. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They complained about Jesus. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord <coughs> and said, now listen, You've you got to enter into this with me. This is an important phrase, so I'm going to ask you to repeat it. <coughs> Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give. Say that with me. I will give. Say it one more time. I will give. I will give my wealth to the poor Lord. Look at that. He's calling him Lord. What does that mean? Hey, you're the one that's in charge. You're the you are the master. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, what's that phrase? I will give them back four times as much. Twice he says it. Once again, we see two possible reactions here. I believe that Zacchaeus was frantic to be released from his lost condition. Why? Because of the way he responds. He does something that is so totally unlike Zacchaeus. What was Zacchaeus' way of living? I will take. I will take. And I will take again. Now, he says, I will give. And by the way, at the risk of being a Greek nerd here, let me share with you about this word, give. In the original language, this is in the indicative present active tense. Sure, right? That means a lot. It does if you pick it apart. What that means is that it's an action that happens. For instance, I pick up a stone and I drop it in the bowl. I did something. But that is in a different tense. It's something that's done and that's it. But in the present active indicative, it means I do this and then I do that and then that and that and that. What Zacchaeus is saying here, I'll not only give back, I'm going to continue to give and give and give. Think what he's doing. Zacchaeus is saying, half of all of my goods is everything I have. Lock it in half, give it to the poor right now, this moment, this day. How many of you want to do that? <laughs> oh, and by the way, if I've cheated anybody, Really, Zacchaeus? <laughs> let's, let's bring out the books and see how well you did with that. If I've cheated anybody, I'll give back four times. You realize how big a loan Zacchaeus would have had to take out to do this? Zacchaeus was very lost. But what did Jesus say about all of that? Look at number seven. After being very lost, Zacchaeus is very found. Jesus responded, verse 9, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. He has shown it. He has demonstrated it. His life has changed. He's not fighting against that. He's doing it. The chief thing that Zacchaeus gave up was that one thing that was standing between him and God is what? Now listen, for any of us, it could be that, or it could be something else. It makes little difference what it is. But the 
fact that it is, is the issue that you have to deal with. Zacchaeus, once the offer was made, could never be the same again. Two takeaways that I want to share with us to take from the worship today. Jesus did make an offer. That's takeaway number one. Jesus was practicing what Amos, the prophet, wrote about in uh, chapter 7, verse 14 of Amos' prophecy. He told the people, wrote it out for them, that he never meant to be a prophet. He said that wasn't, that's not his profession. That's not what he was trained to do. What was he? He was a farmer. He tended sycamore fig trees. And those who tend sycamore fig trees help ripen the fruit by doing a practice called slashing. They got a sharp edge. And at a certain point in the growth of the figs on the sycamore tree, they would put a little gash in. And that, believe it or not, helps the process of the fruit coming out, fruit ripening, fruit uh, being ready. That day that Jesus crossed paths with Zacchaeus, he could have walked past, he could have just basked in the crowd's uh, acclaim, their adoration, their praise. But Jesus recognized something about that sycamore fig tree and the one who was up in that fig tree behind the leaves. He noticed that there was something in that one piece of fruit up there in that tree that needed a push to open. Having the Son of God come to your home when your house has been built on robbing others is something like getting a gash in whatever needs to be turned and exposed to the sun. Incidentally, that's what happens to the fig. When it's gashed, the inside is more exposed to the sun and it hastens the ripening process. And that's what Jesus was doing with Zacchaeus. Come down here. I gotta go to your house today. There's some change afoot. That leads us to the other takeaway, and that's the response of Zacchaeus. You may have something that needed to be slashed. Maybe standing over this bowl or over that bread or near that candle. Maybe something occurred to you about the way somebody spoke to you when you were young that formed you, that changed you. Maybe there's something that still needs to be changed. Maybe you've been resistant all these years about whatever it was. But God, God's brought that back to memory today. And there's a change foot, just like it was for Zacchaeus. Here's how he responded. First of all, he gladly received Jesus' offer. Zacchaeus said yes to Jesus. This diminutive tax collector emptied his heart of greed. He emptied his wallet of ill-gotten gains. In short, he gave away that which was making him sin sick. But then the best of all, Zacchaeus found his life was truly changed. And instead of hungering after earthly wealth, all he can think about now is the heavenly riches of giving and blessing the lives of others that he had previously ruined. He had taken the first step toward God, and Jesus turned it into a dance of joy. The echo of what happened to Zacchaeus is the evidence of a life proving what Jesus said one day to a group of would-be followers on the hillside outside of Jerusalem. They called it the Sermon on the Mount. This is what Jesus said that day. Wherever your treasure is, that's where you're going to find your heart. Wherever your heart is, that will be your treasure. So, Zacchaeus, if you want to know what real joy is like, Jacob, if you want to know what real joy is like, Russell, if you want to know what real joy is like, come out from behind the leaves. Stop watching with the crowd. Instead, invite Jesus into your home. Just be ready for a change, a radical change, when he gets there. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing.